Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Welcome back to another episode of the Work From Home Show. I'm Naresh Vissa with Adam Schrader, as usual, coming from Tampa and Austin. And today we have a third guest. His name is Mo Vela. Mo is the Chief Transparency Officer at Transparent Business. So they're a business that deals specifically with work from home solutions. He's also the first Hispanic to serve in two senior executive roles in the White House, first during the Clinton administration as CFO and senior advisor on Latino affairs in the office of Vice President Al Gore, and later during the Obama administration as director of administration for Joe Biden, who's looking like he could end up being the Democratic nominee for this year's election. He's also the best-selling author of Little Secret Big Dreams, Pink and Brown in the White House. Mo, thanks a lot for coming on the Work From Home show. Hey, guys. It's so good to be with you. Thanks for having me. really is an honor. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your journey to become the first Hispanic American and also the first gay American to serve two senior executive roles in the White House. Well, you can imagine the first emotion that I have to describe about it is humility because it's such, it was just, it's so humbling and honesty, an honor, an honor, what an honor and privilege. So uh, it's humility, honor, and privilege are the three emotions that are elicited when you ask me that question because I grew up in, on the border down in South Texas on the border of Mexico. uh, And I was so blessed to be born into a, pioneer family down there and uh, a long time uh, family of service you know it's you dream right of that chance to call the white house your place of employment and to get to do it more than once frankly was about as close to a miracle as i'm probably ever going to get to (laughs) so how did you work your way up into that though like where what was your connections kind of I mean because one of the big things that we've talked with people about here and kind of growing your work from home business is obviously your network so how how did your network help you reach that point well that's a great question Adam honestly because a couple of things I don't like to mislead people I mentioned it already in my first answer and that I felt very blessed and fortunate to be born into a pioneer family that was uh had a public, you know, awareness. People were aware of our family. Uh, my cousin is currently the congressman from that d- congressional district. As a matter of fact, my brother's the CEO of the large hospital system down there, and my father was the county judge. My uncle was a United States federal judge. The federal courthouse is named Vela. There's two middle schools named Vela, <laughs> one after my father and my uncle. That so people know of, you. <laughs> well, that's kind of what answers your question, and I. I feel very blessed and fortunate to have been born into that family. That said, to further answer your question, network and relationships, as I've learned in my 58 years of life, are the key to everything. Whether you're working from home, whether you own a company, whether you're an employee, a janitor, a teacher, a CEO, a board of director in a boardroom, it doesn't matter what role you play in the ecosystem of humanity. The key to life, in my opinion, from every angle are relationships. And so I hate the word networking uh, (laughs) because it's so cold and stale. And so you just touched on one of my most passionate topics of my life, which is building connective and meaningful relationships. So you know what? I was blessed to be born into that opportunity, but I also take a lot of pride in the thousands of relationships I've developed that I hope every one of them felt like, even if it was 20 seconds, that somehow they connected with me. It wasn't just an exchange of a business card, because I think that is so old school now. i rather connect with one person in a, a room full of, of folks than to pass out 100 cards and not one of them remembers who the hell I am. I completely agree with you. I'm very anti-business cards. In fact, when I go to these like networking events and I get stacks of business cards from people they actually just end up in the bottom of my trash can because 
first off, they take up space. And I remember moving years ago and I had an entire shelf just of business cards. And I said, you know what? Like, I haven't gone through these. I haven't, I have to throw them away. Like, I, I'll have to move. Yeah. I don't have enough space. Yeah, that's right. So, I have boxes of them, believe it or not, still. <laughs> and I bring that up because you wrote a book. And the book is called Little Secret Big Dreams, Pink and Brown in the White House. I believe a book is like the new business card. If you want to find out about someone in their background and get in touch with them, get your book. Get Mo's book, Little Secret Big Dreams. It's available on Amazon. But to me, that's like the new business card, especially if you are trying to make it in business because you can share your expertise. Um, it's a great way to network, to market yourself so people can find you. What are your thoughts about that? You know, first of all, thank you for mentioning my book. Honestly, I've done 176 interviews in the last four months, and not one person's mentioned my book. So you guys are now <laughs> my new best friends. I'll do your podcast anytime you want. No, I'm kidding around. But thank you so much for mentioning my book. You know what? I'll tell you what. To your point, I could not agree with you more. I think it's it's about every one of us as a human being telling our story. Because when we tell our story, as long as we do it authentically and we do it transparently, which my book is painfully authentic and transparent because I touched on subjects that most people would never share with anybody. But I did it, guys, because I think it's important for us to always uh, live vulnerably. When we make ourselves vulnerable, I believe that is what leads to those connective and meaningful relationships I referenced earlier. So that, to me, is the networking of this century. It's making yourself vulnerable, being transparent and authentic so that people can relate to you because there's not one human being that doesn't have something they're insecure about, that doesn't have something in their life journey that wasn't challenging or difficult or emotional or traumatic. And so I talk about growing up in South Texas in the Latino culture of machismo, Catholic, right? Uh, Hispanic, as I just mentioned, the son of a popular politician, this nephew of a federal judge, out in the public eye and knowing since I was seven that I had a little secret. Try doing that in 1968, Texas, right? Yeah. And, you yeah. know, good luck. Uh, yeah, understanding that I couldn't be, say, express, feel who I really was. I had to keep it a little secret as my, the title of my book. I played football, I went hunting, I went fishing, I was an all-star baseball player. I did everything a Texas boy was supposed to do. And all, of course, to not only fit in, but to avoid my true self. So that will explain to your listeners just a little iota of why I am so passionate today uh, about authenticity and transparency. Because I wasn't allowed to be authentic. And I think I, I just pity every human right now, and I fight for them, and I advocate for them. I affirm them. I celebrate them. I honor them. For anybody who doesn't feel that they can be authentic, I beg you, fight for your authenticity. Live your true self. It, it may not be because you're gay. It may be because you're of a different culture or heritage, or you're a rural or urban, or you're ch chubby or you're skinny, or you're blonde or you're bald. Uh, you have an accent or you don't. I don't care what it is, but that is who you are. And so I wrote my book so that people could understand that you can have those challenges and then go on to make American history and serve in the White House twice. And so I didn't write my book out of arrogance. I wrote my book to try to save some kid's life. One of the things you're discussing was the whole you know relationships that we have. And we've been telling people on this show that as they go out and they start working from home, the best thing you can do is to provide value for people. And it's going to be even more important, even if you're just a W-2 employee, because you're going to have to show your value you know, as you're working from home, because sometimes they just see value because you're in the office. Can you look, tell me, looking back on your time in the White House, what value you added to the nation that you're proudest of? Oh, my God. Gosh, I, no one in 10 years has asked me that question. <laughs> so much, seriously. And all the hundreds of interviews I've done that you just you actually got me choked up. Um, <laughs> I would have to say, oh, God, that is a hard one to answer because there is nothing more special for me personally than the chance to have gotten to know two of the greatest American patriots I've ever met in Joe Biden and Al Gore to get to call them my friend 
is the greatest privilege probably I could have ever asked for. They're just such beautiful people, both of them. And their wives, Tipper and Jill, are equally incredible. So I, I, I want to put that out there. But my proudest contribution to my nation, I'll be honest with you, I hope, I hope and pray that it was that every day that I was there, I shared whatever I could with anybody I could. And I'll tell you what I what a good example of what I mean. I think I gave in both tenures, I, I, I gave somewhere around 400 Oval Office West Wing tours. And I think that's my proudest accomplishment because 28 of them were to taxi drivers. So a cab driver would say to me that their dream was to see the White House and I took them. And I think that was my greatest contribution to my nation was that I opened the doors in my own little way to people who would have never had the chance to see the Resolute Desk and the White House West Wing mess and the and just the White House itself and the press room uh, and to share a little bit of our nation with each of them. Honestly, that was one of my greatest contributions was that I opened the doors to as many people as I could in my own way. And I think the last one, I'm sorry, that was more than one, but I just couldn't help it. No, the keep going. One, the other one I have to say is, that I hope that every day I was there, every hour that I served my nation, that one little gay kid or one little Latino kid or one little minority kid somewhere saw that they could too. That's probably the greatest contribution. I'm sorry, you choked me up. <laughs> really inspirational, Mo. Really, really inspirational. Thanks for sharing those kind words. Are you still connected to Joe Biden and his campaign? Yeah, actually, I am. Um, I chose to not be formally connected in the sense that I don't have a formal role at the campaign. And the reason I chose to do that was because, frankly, I felt I could be more helpful to the vice president and his candidacy by doing those 172 interviews or whatever I said earlier uh, in the last four months where I'm able to actually speak more freely. I don't use talking points. I think that's really obvious in your podcast. Nobody tells me what to say. I speak from my heart and I speak from my mind. And I feel like I can be more helpful to him by sharing who I know he is. I consider he and Dr. Biden personal friends of mine and his family, his sister Valerie, is a personal friend. There are few people in my political life that I've ever met that are more sincere, uh, more gracious and kind you know, from little things like that I've never made public, but I will share with you guys because I just I can tell you guys are good people. Um, you know, when the vice president and Dr. Biden met with the pope and Valerie, his sister, I was one of the few rosaries the vice president and his sister brought back that were blessed by the pope. And I received one of those few rosaries they brought back. And so it's little things like that that the Bidens do or dedicate a mass and my father's memory when he passed away two years ago, long after I had worked for them. You know, that's just who they are. They're just, they're full of heart. They're full of love. They're real. They're kind. They're gracious. And I'm proud to still call them very close personal friends. I try to help the campaign in any way that I can when I come up with a, I think I'm probably a pain in their butt, to be honest, because every time I have an idea, I send them a note and say, are you sure you don't want to try it this way? But <laughs> I'm sure half the time they're like, oh, God, it's Mo Vela again. He's, you know, pain in the butt. But I love them too much not to try to help in any little way I can. I think he's the right uh, leader for our nation. I, I don't even want to start getting into talking about what's wrong with the current president, <laughs> because that would be another podcast that would take hours and hours and hours I'd rather focus on something good and, and the future. Yeah, well, I guess the last question about Biden would be the current pandemic. Obviously, we're going to talk about work from home. We have been talking about work from home. But how do you think, given your close relationship with him, your experience with him and his campaigns in the past, how will the current pandemic affect his chances in the upcoming election? Well, first of all, I think this pandemic has changed, obviously, electoral politics and campaigning in dramatic ways. Too many for us to even go into today. But, you know, I think it's fair to say that it's depriving both Donald Trump and Joe Biden of what they enjoy the most probably from campaigning, which is, in Trump's case, those enormous rallies that he has yep. 
Yeah, he gets all that energy from that. Well, he's now deprived of that. And Joe Biden, of course, is more of a retail politicking guy who connects with people uh, in a very real way. And so the rope lines and the and the chances to to lend comfort and those that spirit of unity that Joe Biden brings and that retail politicking level, he's being deprived of that. So I think it's affecting both of them adversely in that respect. I also think, though, on a positive note, you know what? It's it's making them both use social media and digital media. The president has the you know the bully pulpit right now as the incumbent, um, so he's trying his best. It appears to be using that every day during his press conferences that he he guises as pandemic press conferences. But we all know that that's not what they are. They are all they really are become political rallies of sorts. And he talks more about his ratings and himself and who he hates and who he's mad at much more than he is talking about solving the pandemic for our nation. But I honestly think that it gives the vice president, and I think he's trying to strike that delicate balance, and it is a delicate balance. You don't want to look right now as Joe Biden as too political uh, in the middle of this horrific tragedy. But I think what he has to do is contrast, not counter-program, but contrast. How would he have done it differently What solutions does he propose now to make this better, to mitigate the furtherance of the virus? I think that's what I would be focused on, and I think that's what he is focused on. How is it affecting families and children? He did a family town hall last night. How is it affecting small businesses? How is it affecting uh, our economy? Uh, How is it affecting um, single moms? Uh, You name it. I think that's what he should be focused in on, and that's what he's trying to do. Again, he needs to contrast. It's contrasting leadership styles, and I think that's what he can do right now, and that's what he should be doing, and I hope that's what he is doing. Now, one of the things that COVID-19 has made everybody do, obviously, is figure out how to do everything from their house, and this is something that our nation is having to deal with, especially in terms of, you know, the primaries right now. I mean, it has gotten to the point where, you know, we have our presumptive nominee and obviously our incumbent. How have you seen and what are your thoughts on how the nation is going about adapting to that change in the political sense? Both, I mean, you touched on a little bit um, in regards to how they're campaigning, but do you think the nation is ready for this shift before the presidential election in terms of dealing with voting? Well, I hope that. I'm very concerned, and honestly, I'm sickened. I'm sickened to my stomach to hear the president and many Republicans, not all of them, fighting tooth and nail to address the fact that we may not physically be able to go to the polls, and we should right now be talking about mail-in voting, digital voting, whatever other ways that our democracy needs to exist and stay alive during this pandemic, we should be exploring those. And I'm sickened that the president is fighting that. Um, That makes me very angry, if you can't tell it in my voice, (laughs) because the people who are more impacted by when Republicans and the president do that kind of stuff are minorities and folks that are with disabilities who can't physically make it to the polls. We should right now be finding a way to let every single American voice their opinion through their vote. And I don't care how you can get your vote in there. You should have the right to do that. And I think it's time for everybody right now to unite and say we've got to put our minds together and come up with ways that everybody will be able to vote regardless of whether a pandemic exists or not. Period. Hard stop. Well, Mo, you bring up a a good point that I thought about way back, probably in like 2003. And I was wondering, you know, why can't people just vote online? Like we do so much, even way back in 2003, you had all these polls online and digitization. The other thing that kind of muffled me is when it comes to our Congress, they have to physically be present in yeah did you see that yeah i was texting with my cousin who's a member of congress as i mentioned earlier we were just in shock even he was that he was going to have to get on a plane if they didn't have a quorum to come physically vote it's absolutely ridiculous all right mo vela thanks for joining us on this episode you're going to be back on the next episode so to our listeners hang around mo is going to talk about working from home and how the company that he works for now, Transparent Business, is revolutionizing the way 
companies can digitize their processes and how workers can work better remotely. So stay tuned for that next episode coming up. The website you want to go to is transparentbusiness.com and check out Mo Vela's book, Little Secret, Big Dreams, Pink and Brown in the White House. It's on Amazon. I got a chance to skim through it. As you've heard Mo on today's episode, it's just truly an inspiring, tear-jerking story that that he has. It, it's great, regardless of what your politics are. So check out the book on Amazon. Visit transparentbusiness.com. And Mo's going to be right back on the next episode talking about more work from home topics. So until next time, keep on working from home. <laughs>